Hello, this is Robert Whitaker with Epica Animal Health. Today I'm going to talk to you about the 12 case types that are used with the Vimigo HDVI CT. I came up with these 12 case types based on a history of what we saw coming in day in and day out from our clients. We have 300 of these Vimigo CT systems that are installed in Canada and the United States and Mexico. So we have a lot of information to get through on these 12 case types. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can, but this is the best training that I can give anybody who either is about to purchase a Vimigo or already has. Because these are things that as a veterinarian that you need to be thinking about when you go into the exam room to meet a patient because it's not always x-ray that can give us the answers and it's not always ultrasound that can give us the answers. X-ray and ultrasound will often lead us to the Vimigo. And then there's other times where we skip the x-ray, we skip the ultrasound and we go directly to the Vimigo and we'll discuss these things today. So uh, I will go over some proposed fees and uh, give you kind of a example of, of what kind of revenue this could produce in a, in a one to two doctor practice. So that's what the numbers are uh, in each of the slide. So the first thing that we're going to talk about, the first type of case is dentistry. It's the highest case count of exams that are done by Vimigos all over. So most uh, average 20 a month per DVM, per full-time DVM. Uh, most folks are charging about $65. But if you think about it, it takes maybe 20 minutes to do a dental radiograph on a, the full mouth radiographs dentistry for, you know, kitties or pugs or something is really difficult. You know, if you got a German Shepherd, maybe sometimes that's easier and you can do full mouth rads on a Shepherd in about 10 minutes. But we can get 3D skull with information about every tooth in that skull and the condition of the bone and whether or not there's lysis and we see everything so there's no question that we're seeing everything our second case type is nasal and ear exams again we're imaging the skull here but we're using IV contrast because we have suspected rhinitis or maybe we have suspected otitis media or otitis externa so we're going to use IV contrast, which is iohexol, and we can see things like oral fistulas, like in this one here, or we can see otitis media. We can see severe rhinitis. Um, we can see foreign bodies in the nasal passages, you know, nasal, nasal foreign bodies. We see probably six per month for a two-doctor practice of these types of cases. But there are some two-doctor practices out there that are doing three times that, that volume. Um, you know, sometimes the otoscope's just not enough and you need a full view of what's going on inside the head. And the Vimigo is a perfect way to get this information. Brain masses. Still scanning the skull, but again, kind of a different territory. We're using IV contrast for this too. We have to light that uh, blood supply up in order for us to see, uh, you know, a mass that's going on inside of a, a canine or feline patient. And again, you can see this deviated midline, this mass effect here in the brain with the mass itself in 2D. And then this is the same patient down here, and this is lighting up in color in 3D because it's a density change. And we got our feline patient here with a mass. It's almost perfectly spherical. Not as many of these cases are available for us to look at, so we usually, you know, we average about one a month in a one to two doctor practice. Thoracic and abdominal masses. Uh, again, using IV contrast, we're uh, going to look in the, in the chest and the abdomen for, for masses that uh, we may have seen with x-ray or we may have seen with ultrasound. You know, x-ray and ultrasound feed um, the Vimigo on a regular basis. And what happens is we see something with uh, with ultrasound, let's say, but maybe we're not seeing all of it. 
maybe we're unsure of even what we're seeing and what it's attached to. If we scan the animal with a Vimigo and use IV contrast, then we're able to determine, along with the help of our radiologist, you know, what does that blood supply look like? What's a surgery look like if we're going to get that out? What's a biopsy look like if we're going to do something like that? Um, it answers a lot of questions for us because we remove the possibility that things were hiding because they were superimposed. We remove the possibility that, hey, maybe uh, we shouldn't touch this and, you know, maybe we should start considering, uh, you know, some other, some other options with the pet. So it gives you a whole lot more information to take to the client rather than just a guessing game. Spines. We don't always have to do myography on spines. Sometimes, you know, spines get, uh, you know, like this case of pure osteomyelitis where, where we have, uh, you know, the uh, bone marrow disappearing. You know, essentially this is all necrotic through here. And uh, it, what you can't see in this image, but you could see in the 2D image of this case is uh, the nodules in the lungs here just below it. But this thoracic spine is just wasted. And uh, this dog was painful to the touch when it came in. You couldn't touch its spine. It would yelp. And then there's a case like this one where you have mineralized uh, or extruded disc material into the, into the uh, spinal canal there. And, of course, it's causing a compression. So uh, this is an obvious thing right here. That, uh, that we all know uh, doesn't need contrast to, to see. But myelograms are encouraged. Uh, it allows us to see fresh pathology, especially in the disc space. Uh, but we, we, can, we, can, we can see things without myography, and uh, we can definitely get good look at the spine. And it's, it's pretty good uh, technology to look at the spine with in 2D and 3D. We're seeing about two of these a month in a one to two doctor practice. And of course, there's other practices that see a lot more spinal cases, uh, maybe because, you know, they have a surgeon there that can do, that can do spines, um, general practice or, or specialty. Uh, urinary tract disease is a pretty popular one. It's getting more and more, uh, we, we're innovating more and more with what we're doing with contrast. Um, you know, you can utilize um, a renal contrast protocol where we bolus the animal uh, during the scan and then we uh, do another scan after two minutes and then we do another scan after after four minutes and uh, we can see how the kidneys process that contrast into the bladder and at what speed and it gives us an idea of you know whether or not the kidneys are functioning at, uh, at uh, optimal performance and then of course we can see things like adrenal uh, masses like this 3d image up here this turning along with the polycystic disease that's in these kidneys. Or like this case down here in the, in the bottom right corner where you actually have a mass on the kidney. Um, and then you have this case up here to the uh, top left uh, where there's, you know, an occlusion from, uh, from stones. And, you know, when we look at kidney disease, you know, two a month is very conservative. I think we have more than that. In one to two doctor practices, you could probably do quite a few more. And if we look at bones and joints, um, you know, all kinds of things uh, for us to diagnose in bones and joints. You know, whether we're looking at elbows and dogs uh, for coronary process and uh, fractures and fragments and things like that. Um, you know, arthrograms of the knees so we could, you know, evaluate the uh, cranial cruciate or, or caudal or medial cruciate ligaments and evaluate the meniscus, and then of course, you know, we got this uh, vascular necrosis going on here. So, you know, and shoulders, I don't have a shoulder case on here, but shoulders are another way uh, for us to, you know, really evaluate what's going on with the animal when it's lame. And, you know, x-rays are only give, giving us two dimensions. You know, we're only seeing so much of what's going on in that joint space or so much of what's going on uh, in that uh, in, in, in that skeletal system. Angular limb deformities are something else that we can consider as, um, you know, a good use of the Vimigo CT in bones and joints. You know, anytime that we need to, uh, you know, identify an angular limb deformity and then maybe try to correct it with surgery, um, there's two roles that the Vimigo is going to play in a case like that. The first role is we're going to image the animal in 3D and we're going to actually see 
what's going on and be able to measure, uh, you know, what's happened with the, with the limb. Um, the second role is we're going to export that data set out of the uh, Vimigo over to a 3D print shop where they're going to 3D print the desired, the desired bone or bones. Those get FedEx back to the clinic about 48 hours for the doctor to maybe do a practice surgery on before actually opening the patient and performing the real surgery. Don't forget that the Vimigo has fluoroscopy. It allows us to identify swallowing issues, esophageal issues uh, within an animal. Uh, we get a couple of these a month usually where an animal is not swallowing right or an animal's regurgitating a lot. Uh, put some barium in some kibble or barium in a liquid and uh, set the animal into the field of view, take some video, see what's going on. You can share this with a radiologist. You can get a radiologist to help you read these fluoro videos too. Same thing with tracheal collapse or respiratory distress. Um, rather than trying to stress the animal with uh, radiographs, maybe we should put them in the field of view with the fluoro for just a little bit and uh, see if we can evaluate what's happening with the fluoro. Again, if we need a radiologist to review that, we can. The more that we're going to be able to use fluoro, the better we're going to get at it, whether we're using it for esophageal studies or respiratory studies. The fluoroscopy is going to take some time for a practice to learn because the staff has to get used to timing and coaxing the animal and managing the animal and managing the machine all at once. And the more they do it, the better they get at it. And pretty soon it becomes second nature to use it. GI foreign bodies. Um, you know, we're going to try to hunt for these with x-ray and ultrasound first most of the time. But sometimes those yield nothing. And then we scan it with a Vimigo and we get this. You know, we see something that we didn't see with an x-ray. And uh, we get to go in and get it. And uh, everyone's happy. So, again, you know, we're not canceling out the use of ultrasound or we're not canceling out the use of x-ray. The Vimigo is a lot of times going to be the place for us to go ahead and do that GI foreign body search first. If we're suspecting a foreign body, maybe we should go ahead and skip through the steps of ultrasound and, and x-ray and we just go ahead and, and uh, get the animal, um, if, if possible, under anesthesia and uh, scan the animal's abdomen and thorax and see, see what we get. Um, using IV contrast is heavily recommend, highly recommended when we're looking for foreign bodies. Um, sometimes if we do a pre-contrast scan, like in this case, uh, we see the foreign body right away and there was no need to deliver contrast. Shunts and vascular anomalies, you know, things like torturous vessels, you know, these things can be very troublesome to find. And I'm sure that many of you have always just thought about referring these. Uh, to a specialist, and, and that's probably what many of you have done, but you don't really have to do this if you have a Vimigo. Um, you know, if your labs and, and your differentials are pointing to possibly a shunt, then you can put this animal on the Vimigo, deliver some IV contrast, scan, send to a radiologist, let them report back to you where those shunts are, and whether or not, you know, corrective action can be taken or should be taken. And same thing goes for like a vascular ring anomaly here, a bunch of torturous vessels here. You know, it's not just a shunt, but we're talking about all kinds of vascular abnormalities. Last but not least, trauma, hit by cars, dog fights, etc. You know, it's easy for us to take an x-ray of a hit by a car and go, oh yeah, it's got a broken bone, or um, oh yeah, we've definitely got some issues. But if we go ahead and skip past that, um, and we're allowed to go ahead and get the animal into the CT, uh, let's get 3D. Let's uh, let's capture, you know, what all's going on. So, at the end of the day, when you look at 
you know, a machine like this sitting in a practice of one or two doctors, whether it's in the country or whether it's in the city, you know, if you're doing this right and you're thinking about the 12 cases and you got about the same kind of volume everyone else does that has our machine, uh, this thing can sit here and generate about $12,000 a month. It does much more than that in other practices. This is just being conservative. So there's more than just what we're generating in terms of the revenue itself from the scan. We're using teleradiology. That means we're getting educated and we're getting backed up by the radiologist on a daily basis. We're going to use contrast agent. It's going to help us see things better in the soft tissue realm. Anesthesia and monitoring is absolutely required. And all these things are additional services, by the way. Whether or not your hospital is charging for them, it's going to be up to your manager or your management on how they charge for it and when they're charging for it. Teleradiology, I recommend you should be charging for when you use it. Iohexol contrast should be charged for when you use it and by dosage amount. Anesthesia monitoring, that can be a flat fee or it can be included with the scan charge. Um, looking at all the different surgeries that now we're going to be able to do because we can diagnose and see more than we've ever seen before. So we're going to increase in our dental surgeries. We're going to increase in our abdominal and thoracic surgeries. And I think a practice will increase in their orthopedics surgeries, which allows them to increase in rehab and therapies like, you know, laser, stem cells, etc. We have to think about all of those services as well and our basic antibiotic and steroid therapy. So there's a lot that comes along with the Vimigo that is just more than learning more, doing more, diagnosing more. Um, we have, you know, a unit that's going to bring the whole practice up and bring the veterinarians up to a higher standard of care. You can email me or uh, give me a call anytime with uh, questions. Don't forget um, to take a look at my blog, uh, dxdvm.com. That's D is in dog, X is in x-ray, dvm.com. Uh, and if you haven't signed up for uh, my weekly case that goes out every Tuesday morning on email, you can send me an email and request that you be added to my list. And I'll send you on every Tuesday morning our case of the week from the Vimigo CT. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Have a great day.